Can you guys give it up for Aaron and Jamie You're doing a great job. <clears throat> Bless you guys. You guys did quite well in that game. I'm impressed. It's, uh, it's a tricky game to play, but you did well. Hey, before we, oh, God bless you. See, there's a nice cold cherry coat for me. You're very kind. Um, before we begin, I'm gonna open with a word of prayer. And <clears throat> we got, really do have a very important topic tonight and we've got some fun stuff that we'll do. And, um, but we have a couple people in particular that celebrated a birthday this week. Ben Bender, stand up, Ben. And Scott O'Neill, Scott O'Neill, right back there. <clears throat> Without these two guys, our ministry would be very, very different. And uh, if you see them, say happy birthday. It's their week. And I think there's someone's birthday is actually today. Eden? Is Eden in here? Happy birthday to Eden. It's actually today. So happy birthday, Eden. So it's a blessing to celebrate a birthday. And so if you see any one of those three, make sure you go out of your way to say thank you for your life because uh, they make a difference. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to talk about a really important topic tonight, um, one that has a couple different object lesson things and stuff that hopefully helps you, because of all the topics that we do, this is the most important, so why we start with it, number one, okay? So as you did last time, you did a phenomenal job last time, that when I'm talking, you're not talking, you listen, you learn, and you try to help other people learn by paying attention, Okay? And if you choose not to do that, well, then we'll have a different discussion. But you guys did so well last time. I was so proud of you. It's a sign of maturity. Um, so I really, really hope that you can do that again tonight. And we've got some introductory funny pictures to get us started. But um, let's pray before we start. Jesus, we thank you and love you. We thank you for loving us. And I pray that your Holy Spirit nudges us in the direction of discovering your will and your great love for each and every person in this room. Father, I know that uh, life is busy. I know that life has lots of distractions, but I'm so proud of the students and leaders for being here because they chose to make a choice to be in your house and to study your word and let it study them and change them. And Father, as we look at this area of tonight called spiritual fitness, talking about the soul, I pray that we would take good care of this area of our life because if we do, it will impact every other area of our life. If we don't, it will negatively impact every area of our life. So help us to have a humble heart, a life that's willing to change, and may you get the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. So as we did a little bit last time, we did a couple of funny pictures in the front end, and I'll do that not every time, but this time we'll, um, this I thought was a funny picture. This animal knew where to go to get help, just curled up in a Jesus statue, very, very smart animal. Um, if you like animals and you've seen this movie, the, I, the um, similarities are crazy. Um, these dogs look a lot like Lady and the Tramp, so it's kind of fun. Um, and then if you like animals in cartoons, I thought this was a funny thing they put on the side of a bus. <laughs> they put the feet so when the wheels go around, it looks like uh, this particular character that many of you might know um, is cruising. Yes, there you go. Very well. Very well done. And then this I thought was just cool. Uh, if you've ever enjoyed seeing a forest, um, they made this look like it's like a time warp. They kind of made it look like, hey, enter this area and it's like another area uh, altogether. It was just kind of a cool look. So if you have a, a backyard, don't do this without your parents' permission. But um, if you have this kind of wooded lot, maybe you can do that and freak your neighbors out. Um, and then as we talked about um, outfits and different things last time that were just funny things, um, this one caught my eye. It was kind of weird. Yeah, is that not weird? I don't think I could look at her very well without freaking out. And this outfit, we don't even want to look at it much longer. So nonetheless, this is what we talked about last time. We talked about the choices. Turns out they matter. And we want to talk about these ideas and these choices. And we talked about a couple things really quickly. We talked about that there's decisions that you'll make in each day. There's decisions that will impact decades of your life. And there's decisions of whether you trust Christ as your Savior or not determines where you'll spend the rest of your eternity when you die. So day, decades, and death is what we talked a little bit about last time. And then we talked about this idea that key choices, the three C's, the choice to follow Christ, the choice to be a person of character, 
person who's predictable in, in environments when you're even not there because of who you are, and then community, what you're doing right now, being in a group of people that are trying to love and learn together. We talked about this idea in, De- in Deuteronomy where it says you have the choice of life or the choice of death. And basically, God gives us choices. Every single day, we have choices. And when we go through these choices, it helps us understand by watching you who you're listening to. So we talked about this, that Jesus talks about the wise and foolish builder. The wise builder builds his house on the rock, and the foolish builder built his house on the sand. And so what we're going to be talking about tonight is this idea of how do we build our life in such a way that people see we're making wise choices. So if you remember at the very end of the last show, I told you a story when I embarrassed myself and I laid on the horn to a person and then I went and apologized because it wasn't the person I thought it was. It wasn't Pastor Jason, it was a complete stranger. So in that particular moment, I didn't have a lot of time to make a choice, but as I review my own life and wanna be known as a person who follows Christ, has good character, and wants to build community rather than destroy it, the decision was easy. The Holy Spirit told me, hey, you go and make that right and apologize to that lady and buy her her breakfast or her coffee. And so when you and I make choices, those choices ripple into not only our life, but the lives of those around us. And that's why what we're going to talk about tonight is so important. Because as a pastor who's cared for people for a long time, this is an area a lot of people neglect. And their life shows it. They just don't realize this is the area they're neglecting. So I hope you get excited about it. I hope it's a fun topic for you. Um, But here's what we're going to look at, okay? Here's your first fill in the blank. Under the idea of soul, which is in the middle of your notes, because we've kind of covered the first part there, what do we mean when we say the soul? Spiritual fitness is this idea of, of doing the work of the soul. So it's the eternal version of you. It's the version who will live forever, This is a part of you that will never die. And just as in your first fill in the blank is, just as you have been given a unique physical DNA, makes you one of a kind, there's no one who looks exactly like you. Even identical twins, while they look identical, are different. And so you have a physical DNA that makes you unique, but you also have what I would call a spiritual DNA, or a mark of who you are in your soul. That God has basically made each and every one of us unique. And in the response of understanding our soul, we're going to learn how we can care for it in a society that does not take very good care of the soul. So if you see underneath that same section, the goal of the soul is to walk in wisdom, walk in the ways of God who gave you your soul. How do we weaken the soul in spiritual fitness? And how can we strengthen it is really the question we're going to look at tonight. But I want to jump up right before we get to the next part. I want to jump up to the verses above that where it says in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. The Bible calls people who choose to not develop their soul and develop an understanding of who God is a fool. Proverbs 19, 3 says a man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. It's a very famous verse that we share a lot here. Because there's lots of times that people get mad at God for things God told you not to do. And when it doesn't work out in your life and you get mad at God for doing things he told you not to do, but you blame him, that's backwards. It's literally the fulfillment of this verse. A man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. But God in his patience and love for us says this to us in his word. Ecclesiastes 3.11. Jump down to foundational part of uh, the middle of your notes. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. God has put in our heart and in our soul and in our very mind a sense that something's bigger than us. The very fact that we're on a planet that's going spinning at the speed that it is, completely suspended in space, and rotates in a way that allows us to have four distinct seasons, and very predictable time frames of the sun comes up, sun goes down, a new day. Sun comes up, sun goes down, a new second day. The order is a design by a God who made us and made his creation. And I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. It's at the bottom of this PowerPoint. 
It says, if I, find my, <clears throat> if I find in myself a desire which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. This isn't home. It will one day be home in a, in a glorified sense, the way that God will make it. But you and I have a responsibility to build a life that God says, that's what I designed you to be. So here's your verse, your next verse, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So when you and I love him, like he loves us, I promise you, it changes us from the inside out. And so here's what I want you to understand. I have been around lots of people, and one of the things that you see the older you get is guys in particular, girls will do this too, but guys in particular will be like, do you have a gym? Do you have a gym gym you work out in? I have a gym. And they sit there and they lift their weights. They're like, can you tell I have a gym? And they like walk around like, can you tell? Like they sit there and flex and all that stuff. And ladies, usually you're hilarious. You're like, no, actually I can't. And they're like, oh, they're deflated, you know. But there's people who have a physical gym. They have a place they do sit-ups, they do push-ups, they do workouts, they lift weights, they do all that stuff. But here's the question. The Bible actually says that physical training is of some value in First Timothy. But spiritual training has value both for this life and the life to come, the Bible says. We're going to study that in a couple of uh, Live at the Lofts later. The Bible says that spiritual training is more important than physical training. Because it, it blesses you not only in this life, but also in the next life. And so here's what I want you to see. Under foolish living, what can suffocate or weaken our soul? What can cause our soul to really struggle because we make choices to make it struggle? One of the reasons is they have no spiritual fitness gym. I'm going to teach you how to have a spiritual fitness gym in a way that will not only bless your life today, but it will bless your life for years and years to come if you do it. So Proverbs 10.4 says this. Proverbs 10.4 says, In his pride the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. Ecclesiastes 10, 1 through 3, you can read the whole section. It's actually um, really, really strong in terms of some key things. But verse 3 is all we had room for, so it says this, Even as he walks along the road, the fool lacks sense and shows everyone how stupid he is. The fool doesn't even realize he's a fool. Many times the fool is so proud of his foolishness that he doesn't even realize what he says, what he does, is not necessarily wise in the way God would want him to live. Proverbs 12, 1 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. You and I should learn to be correctable, to be teachable. Proverbs 28, 6, he who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. And then Proverbs 9, I love this, Proverbs 9, 13 through 18, the woman folly is loud. She's undisciplined and without knowledge. I will tell you one of the techniques of the enemy to keep you from coming to church, keep you from reading your Bible, keeping you in a a position of enriching your soul, the number one characteristic I think that the enemy is doing really well with is he creates a loud society. He makes it so loud that you have to work hard to be still and know that he's God. He surrounds you with constant, constant, constant screens. Constant noise, constant sounds in in terms of stuff you don't need to even hear or know. So he can turn up the volume, he'll keep you distracted, and he'll keep you from the things that will enrich your soul. The woman folly is loud. She's undisciplined and without knowledge, and you can read the rest of the passage. So here's what I want you to see as another fill in the blank for you in this section Another way that you can weaken or suffocate your soul is you basically allow yourself to be dehydrated. I'm going to give you some reasons for how you get dehydrated. But a dehydrated soul is a dried shell version of yourself. It is discernible to see. You can see people who are practicing the hydration of the soul, as we're going to get to in a few minutes, and you can see people who are allowing their soul to be dehydrated. 
If you've ever seen a dehydrated piece of fruit, it looks really dry and frail. And if you see a a well-ripened piece of fruit, it's the complete opposite. Hence, you see grapes, hydrated, dehydrated, or raisins, completely dehydrated. And so when you see this, why it's important for us to be in the fill in the blank, you don't want to be a dehydrated soul. Because you become a dried version, you become brittle in the sense you're very impatient. You tend to argue a lot because you know you're not right. You can feel it on the inside. Because as we read earlier in Ecclesiastes 3, God has placed in each and every person their soul to have a sense of right and wrong and a sense of something is bigger than us. And that something is God who says, I love you. And he demonstrated it through his son, Jesus Christ. So how are some, what are some ways you can dehydrate your soul? This is what you can do right here. This is your chart that's below you. You can practice atheism, believe that there is no God, but Proverbs 10.4 says that's not wise. You can be prideful and uncoachable, Proverbs 12.1. You can be loud in your living, Proverbs 9, some of the verses we went through. And if you want to continue to suffocate your soul and dehydrate your life of any strength that God could provide, then avoid God's word, Avoid God's church, avoid God's people, avoid God's creation, avoid God's correction, and avoid God's call on your life. And I can predict who you will become. It is not guesswork for me anymore. You will be a very impatient, restless person on the inside because your soul is so dehydrated. You don't know who you are, you don't know where you're going, and your life has this brittle flavor to it, so to speak. And I'll say this before we flip the the page to the next part. I've coached enough games that if you see a dehydrated athlete, did you know dehydrated athletes don't think very quick, they don't move very quick, and actually their movements are very sloppy? So when I would coach my fairly high-level soccer games and some big tournaments in different parts of the country, one of my jobs as a coach is to win the game. You know who I'd look for? I'd look for the dehydrated player on the other team. Because I knew that their movements would be sloppy, I knew that they would be lazy, they wouldn't have energy, and they were going to be easy to beat. And pretty much every time they were. So if you choose to dehydrate your soul, your life is going to be sloppy, you're not going to think very clearly on the key areas, and you're going to be easy to beat. You're going to be easy to defeat, because you really don't have the strength that God wants you to have. So when you put all that together, I want you to be excited about this idea because the more we hydrate with the the things that God wants us to, the more our souls will be strong. So flip the page over. Flip the page over. You guys are doing great. So how do we do faithful, wise living? Here's your first verse, James 3, 13. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? This is the Bible asking the question. Hey, if I'm asking your friends, who's wise and understanding among you? The answer is let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. You know what that basically translates? Show me, a, show me a person who makes wise choices and I'll show you a person who's wise. Show me a person who makes foolish choices and I'll show you a person who's foolish. The Bible makes it very clear. Second Timothy 2.22 says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You and I have to make some decisions in our lives so that we make the choices that God can enrich our soul and enrich our life in such a way that we're hydrated. So here's the part I want you to see in this this next fill in the blank that you have. The things that strengthen your soul all leads to hydrated soul and it makes you alive or invigorated. You're living a true version of how God created you. And I can tell you this is also discernible. This is the type of person who's allowing God to strengthen their soul by spending quiet time with him and doing the things we're about to talk about. And when that happens, they're excited to be alive. There's an energy to their life. They're excited to get up in the day. They're excited to train with something that God said, hey, I made you good at this. Let's go play that for for this, this, and this reason. And you're excited to live The person who dehydrates their soul is usually grumpy, bored, lazy, but the person who allows their life to be hydrated, they have energy. 
They're alive. They're alert. Because God says, you're paying attention to me. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to live through you. And you and I are going to have a blast loving people. I'm telling you, if you can learn this, this is huge. So here's your chart that we gave. If you want to have a hydrated soul, you allow Jesus to redeem you, Jesus to disciple you, Jesus to live through you. And I've given you some verses here. You're a person who loves God's word, loves God's church, loves God's people, loves God's creation. You learn to love God's correction. It's not always easy to be corrected by him, but you learn to love it because the motive is love. And you seek to live in God's call for your life. You're becoming a hydrated athlete. And because of it, people are seeing a change in you and they're seeing not only a change in you, but you're maybe changing their life because they're starting to ask questions. Why are you so excited about each day? I'm not saying every day. We all have days you're like, oh my gosh, today's a hard day. But most days you're excited. Most days you're writing things down. And so when you put all that together, I've got an object lesson I'm going to do and show you in just a second. But I want you to see that when you're a person that practices some of this, and you're a person who actually says, God, I want to have a well-worn Bible because I want to read it. I want to live it. And I want to be known as a person who prays. I want to be known as a person who says, God, I need your help. And here's the part of prayer that you and I don't get. When we go to prayer, we think, well, I don't think anything happened. Maybe not yet. Maybe not yet. I have prayed long enough to know that there's what you would call a domino effect. You like dominoes? I got these dominoes at a, at a place where they were having domino tournaments on the streets in Dominican Republic. It was awesome. These guys were playing dominoes like they play chess, and man, were they good. And so I sat there, and I'm like, you know what? If I'm ever going to buy dominoes, I'm buying them in the Dominican Republic. So I have these really cool dominoes. We were looking at a possible mission trip we were going to do. But I want you to think about this before we transition to this next part. I want you to just see this clip. We're not going to see all of it. But when you pray and ask God to help you, to nourish your soul and help nourish other people, there's a domino effect. I want you to see this for about one minute. Enjoy this clip. Watch it for honor. I know. You're like, guess what? They all fall. <laughs> Just want to tell you. So here's what I want you to see, okay? This is what I want you to get before we go to our little object lesson for you, okay? I want you to see that when you pray, somehow, I can't explain how God does this, but I've seen him do it countless times in my own life and other people. When you say, it's truly surrender to him and say, God, I need your help on this, he's like, I've been waiting for you to ask. And all of a sudden, it's like a domino effect. He starts going, bam, watch this. And he starts networking with other people who end up finding you to talk to you about something that leads you to this way, that way. And you've invited him into the equation in ways that you will stand like I have many times, stand back and be like, God, I can't believe you answered the way that you did. It's so much bigger than me. Because I invited you in, you showed your power by doing stuff I could never orchestrate on my own. It's a domino effect. So I want you to learn that and be excited about it, but here's your diagram I want you to do. Draw a circle. And as you draw this circle, you're gonna put a circle in the middle. The circle in the middle represents what we're talking about today. It's this idea of what's number one. 
So I'm going to show you another picture that's similar to it. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically put this little circle in the middle. It's number one because this is kind of like a wheel. You could also look at it as like a pizza, but it's a wheel with many spokes. And the center is a, the axle of the wheel. So in as much as you grow to be more strong in your soul and your walk with Jesus, the smoother the ride will be in the sense that he's going to walk with you. Won't always be smooth, I promise you that. Follow living for Christ is not easy. But the more you surround yourself with his word, his people, etc., etc., the larger that circle becomes and the stronger your ride becomes. Okay? What we're going to talk about is this area right now, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going to go through choices in topic number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. We're going to train you in some of these key choices, and if you so choose to say, you know what, I don't want to do number three very well, well then three doesn't get to be out here. Three stays here. So as the wheel goes around and around, guess what happens? It gets really bumpy because you refuse to grow up. But if you grow, God can make your life smoother in the sense of maturity, but also impact other people. And we're going to talk about how you do that. So just draw the diagram for right now. We're going to come back to it in a little bit more detail um, in the weeks to come. But for the sake of time, I want to give you some other uh, fill in the blanks. Your first fill in the blank under one here is this. This is the discipline, okay? The discipline that I'm asking you to do. We're going to make some choices. I'm going to set you up to make choices. So choice number one is get up. Get up, create time, add time by spending time with your creator, your redeemer, and the perfecter of life. Mark 1.35 says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now I know that in middle school, some of you get on the bus at like 6.30, 6.20. So when I was in middle school, you know when I did quiet time? I did quiet time at night. Because I didn't get up super, super, super early. I did my quiet time at night. I'd say, Mom, Dad, I'm going to bed a little early. And I'd sit there, I'd read my Bible, I'd read some devotional stuff, I had a little notebook, and that's what I did. And I'd put it up by the side of my bed, and I usually slept like a baby. Because my last thoughts were about him. So I don't know when you want to carve time to be with him, but have the discipline to get up. Spend time with him, either early in the morning or late at night. Here's the math I've given you in the, in the bottom of this little uh, PowerPoint, but also in your handout. Let's say if you did the math, you got up early, you have a Jesus chair, a place that we're about to talk about, and you went there one hour a day, just tried to get there like, and spend it like 30 minutes to an hour. If you did an hour a day, which is really actually not hard given the other screens that you look at, seven hours a week, seven hours a week times four weeks is 28 hours a month. 28 hours divided by 12 hour days gives you an extra 2.3 extra 12 hour days a month or 4.6 extra six hour days a month. Meaning you find, if you take five, it was on average say five, five six hour days times 12 months a year gives you 60 extra six hour days a year of praying, planning, and pursuing. Do you think your peers are gonna be in the same spot as you? Absolutely not. Because you've invited the one who made the heavens and the earth into your life and you have spent 60 extra six-hour days with him. And he teaches you and trains you. Hey, you know what? I gifted you to do this. Let's start working on this together. Because maybe you can play this sport in high school. Maybe you can do this instrument on the worship team. Maybe you can. You start, he starts preparing you because you pay attention. And then it develops and develops and develops. So getting up is part of it. Second one. We got some pictures of people who do their quiet time in between. I'm going to show you. This is one picture of one of our students. The second one, grow up. Part of what will happen when you do quiet time is the Holy Spirit's going to love you enough to say, hey, this is an area I have more for you. Let's grow up in this area. It's why we're going to talk about the wheel getting bigger and bigger in terms of diameter. We've joked about this for years. If you watch a little kid on a bike, how much harder do they work? They pedal so hard because their wheels are so little. Like, ah! And mom and dad are like, ah. Super easy because their wheels are bigger. The more you grow, the more you can be wise and not have to work as hard to keep up with all of the other stuff that you're going to be asked to do in your life. 
This is a great verse in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. There's a part that I put underneath here. It says, to be childlike in our faith is to do what children do. They scale taller things than themselves. They trust those who love them by following them without fear. God wants us to have childlike faith. But what God doesn't want is for us to be childish, to ignore responsibility, what life requires for us to get older, and the responsibilities that you will have in the not-too-distant future. Here's your final uh, point in a second. This is another uh, example. This is from uh, Henry Wolf. actually. He's one of our high schoolers. This is his quiet time space. It's uh, his quiet time desk, as he calls it. Um, we're going to show you mine in a little bit. Um, last one, third one, game on. So it's get up, grow up, and game on. I want you to get dialed in in your choices in such a way that people see that there's something different about you. You're, paying the, the, you're putting the time in to grow your soul, to feel God's peace, and to take quiet in a very rushed and hectic world. You're taking the time to be still and know that he's God and that he loves you and that he wants you to listen to him and live for him. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 says this, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Strict training means exactly that. You're not casual. For some reason, people get strict training in sports, in music, in academics, but for some reason, when it comes to the Bible, they're like, you know what, well, God understands. I don't have to go into strict training and learn that. Of all the things you learn in strict training, this is the number one. This is the number one. This is the only thing that you could own that's inexhaustible. Do you know that? You could read this every day of your life and still learn new stuff. You will never look at this book and say, I have it completely mastered. I know everything there is to need to be known about this book. And the more you learn this book, the more this book will teach you what's wise and what's foolish, and God will protect you, and he'll say, hey, I'm really proud of you. You made the wise choice. Because you've listened to me, because we had a dream that we wrote down on paper that we're working on, you said no to the right thing and said yes to the, the right thing. Because of it, your life's gonna be different. And so when you do all that, it helps you. Here's the way that you can do it. This is another example of a student in our high school ministry. Um, this is her quiet time space. She put this underneath um, in her basement. It's underneath the steps. If you notice, these are steps right here. So she put a bunch of stuff. I want you to design your own. This is their spiritual gym. They probably have a physical gym that they work out, but this is their spiritual gym. What will yours look like? So I want you to be thinking about it. I want you to get your place set up in some place, and if you get them right, send a picture to us. We'll send an email so you can do it, and I'll put them up there. I might not be able to put all of yours up there. If you look in the room, it might take us a while, but I would love to have you guys say, hey, this is what I designed, and this is where I meet with Jesus on a daily basis. So here's your final little part here. I want you to see in this chart that I've given you a couple of fill in the blanks. I want you to create a space, create a time, and create a rhythm. As you create a space like these, you're gonna look forward to going in there. I've had my space in a closet when I started. It first started in my bed, then it eventually went to a closet, then it went to the back room of our house, and then now it is finally in a really good room that I am so grateful for. But it's changed multiple times, but it's all had similar attributes in terms of the space. My time that I spent with Jesus has changed over the years. When I was in middle school, it was during the time of in the evening because I just couldn't, I couldn't get up even earlier because a lot of times I had soccer practice in the night. And so I would spend time at the end of the day just reading my Bible and saying, God, thanks for another good day. We'll see you in the morning. It was just a rhythm. And that rhythm changed my life. That rhythm protected me from a lot of stupid choices in high school. And I give God the glory for that. And then the last one in this fill in the blank is create a rhythm. The rhythm I'm gonna explain in a few minutes here. There's a couple ways you can do this to make it so that your life has a rhythm that you get excited to go in your quiet time at spiritual gym with Jesus. And when you do that, I'm telling you, it changes how you live in your own life. 
Pastor Chip is taking us through the book of 2 Timothy. It's some of the classic lines from the Apostle Paul in the last moments of his life. It's a great book. And if you look at the beginning of that book in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 1, Paul says to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God. Meaning Timothy had responsibility like you have to do the work of developing the strength of your soul. The Holy Spirit will help you, but you got to meet God part way. And if you do that, I promise you, he will be more than excited to teach you what he's been dying to tell you. But you and I are sometimes too busy to listen. And when we listen, I'm telling you, it lights a fire in you. Here's your next couple of fill in the blanks that you see right here. Read scripture. Your Bible is one way that you can spend your quiet time. There's times when I do my quiet time where I don't read my Bible. I just listen to worship music. I put headphones on. Jamie's put a, a playlist together for us for the loft. You can download that and just sit there and listen to some of the worship music that Jamie and the team are going to take you through. Develop your own Spotify account if you want. Sometimes you can just sit there and you're like, you know, I'm just going to pray today. And you write down people you're praying for. Write down pr- things that you're, you're in pain about in your life. And you say, God, I need your help in this. And when you pray, you get up and you think, well, what did that do? I just want you to remember the image of the dominoes. It did do something. You just don't see it yet. You invited God into the equation, and he's going to help you start solving stuff because he can solve stuff. We just have to ask for his help. And when you get to that, another part that I do in my quiet time is I grab a pad of paper and I just dream. That particular day, I might read a verse or two. Um, Many of us are are going through these books. Um, Pastor Brian and Pastor Chip and others put these together, um, finding different books that we go through as a church. This is the one we're going through right now. You simply grab the page, and some people do their quiet time. They read the section, they pray, and that's it. But for me, I've learned that I don't want it to be just 15 minutes. I started at 15 minutes, then I went to 30 And 30 minutes wasn't enough. Then it went to be an hour. And I say this not to brag to you, but I just tell you, I just love hanging out with Jesus in the rushed life that I live. I usually spend about two hours with him in the morning before most people get up. And I'm telling you, it drastically changes how I approach the day. And I'm telling you, he wants time with you. And there's times that you're going to say, I just want to read the Bible today. There's times you're going to be like, I just want to worship today. There's times I'm going to be like, I just want to pray today. And there's times he's going to be like, God's giving you ideas. You're like, I just want a pad of paper and a pen, and I'm going to dream. I'm going to design stuff. And then lastly, I would say, have a, have a picture um, wall in your little area of showing, take a picture of key areas where God's been faithful in your life and that be fruitful. So when you have all this, as I close in prayer, I want you to have a Bible in this place. I want you to have a blanket, have a hot chocolate mug. That's what I usually have. I have my hot chocolate mug. Um, and I sit there and I enjoy time with, the, with Jesus. This is my particular um, area. Um, again, space, time, rhythm. Sorry, it was out of rhythm. Um, this is my chair that I sit in. Um, I've been in that chair for a very long time, uh, hanging out with the Lord. This is what uh, my desk looks like. This is a place I write a lot of messages with you guys. Uh, for you guys, it's a pretty cool, that desk is 1890. It's a roll top desk. It's awesome. I love it. This is the view that I have from my chair. This is a, a, a fake fireplace that's awesome. I got it for like 50 bucks at Menards. And it's awesome because on rainy days, I sit in my chair and this is my view. I sit there with my hot chocolate right over here. I have my Bible right up here. And these are the notes from Sunday I was reviewing. It was a rainy morning and I had the fireplace right there. And I just said, Lord, Teach me to love people for you. So I'm asking you to allow God to feed your soul. I'm asking you to create a spiritual gym. Because if you create a spiritual gym, I'm telling you, the way in which God's going to move through your life is drastically different than if you allow your life to be dehydrated from a very busy culture that will never, ever want you to be still and know that he's God but he wants you to know him. He wants you to love him. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would move in our hearts in such a way that we see you living in and through us. And I pray, Father, that at the end of this series, we sense that we've really grown. We've grown in our awareness of your love for us and the ability that we have to respond to you. Father, I pray that you give these students and leaders really creative ideas of what they could do to create a spiritual gym, a Jesus chair, a place that they can meet with you daily or at least several times a week to get started. 
And I pray that they sense something different happening in their life because they spend time with you. Jesus, thank you for how much you love us. Help us to love to seek time with you because I know that you love to spend time with us. Listen to our prayers of concern. Listen to our prayers of praise and listen to us as we sing praise to you, our God and our King, because we love you and we seek to live a life that glorifies you. In Christ's name we pray and all God's people said. So here's what I want for you. I want you to live a well hydrated life. But maybe at this level, this is a super hydrated bottle that tells you at 7 a.m. drink up to here, 9 a.m. Get to here, keep going, drink, drink all the way, and it says yay at the bottom. The reason I show you this is the closing illustration. A well hydrated life in the Holy Spirit is a life that we're reading about in the book of Acts. Ordinary people doing ex extraordinary things because they invite Jesus into the equation. And the domino effect changes history not just your life. So please create a space, put your notepad, put your blanket, all that stuff, send us pictures and then start using the space and see how God starts to shape you as you listen to the playlist that Jamie puts together, as you listen to the stuff that we go through here at the Live at the Loft on Sunday mornings. I'm so proud of you for being here and I'm so excited for you to learn this because so few people take the time to develop a spiritual fitness gym called a holy place or a Jesus chair. Let's pray. Father, help us to be known as a people that love you and seek to live for you. But we don't live such busy lives that we don't spend time in your word and just enjoy a hug from you. There are days we need a hug. There may be many days we need a hug. So help us, Father, through the work of your Holy Spirit to be creative, to create a space that we can meet with you in a way that's not rushed and that truly allows you to sharpen us and become a better example of you in the world. That we don't just sing praise to you on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, but our very life demonstrates that we seek to have the character of Christ and we help build community in such a way that people see that we're not just talking about Christianity, we make the sacrifice to get up, spend time with you, and ultimately, Lord, that will change a whole bunch of stuff in our days. So, Father, be with us as we go home. Help us to be excited for what you're going to teach us, and help us to have a great rest of this series, getting first things first, and that's our walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Here's a quick announcement for next week. Next week, invite your friends because next week is Blacklight Night. <laughs> next week is Blacklight Night and then we will soon have some stuff for you to sign up for Fall Retreat. And in the next Live at the Loft, you'll hear more about what we're doing this summer. We've got some cool plans for you this summer, ones that we think you're really gonna like. So stay tuned. Thank you for being here. And I pray that you guys have a blessed rest of your week. We'll see you Sunday. God bless.